Did Jesus die for the sins of the whole world, or did he die only for the elect? Is the doctrine of limited atonement biblical? I'm going to make a biblical case today for the fact that Jesus died not only for the elect, but for the sins of the whole world. But before I do that, I want to point out that the Reformed view is not the doctrine of limited atonement. It might surprise you to learn this, but all of the early reformers believed that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And I'm going to put a bunch of quotes in the description of this video to show you that John Wycliffe believed that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. John Hus, Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, John Knox, all of the early reformed creeds taught that Jesus died for the sins of the world. And when you read the quotes, you'll see that many of them were familiar with the idea that Jesus only died for the elect, but they still believed that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And in this video, I want to present a biblical case for the biblical teaching that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. First of all, I want to look at a number of scriptures that specifically connect the word world with Jesus being the savior of the world. Let me read some of these verses to you. The first one, obviously, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John chapter 4, verse 42. They said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this man is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. John chapter 6, verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. John chapter 12, verse 47, and we'll look at this in more detail in a moment. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This passage is interesting because uh, John is not writing specifically to Jews. He's writing to uh, Gentile Christians living in Asia Minor. And he says to those believers that Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Now there's one more passage in this list that I want to read to you. It's 1 John 4.14. 1 John 4.14. And we have seen and testified that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour. Of the world. Now, to me, those verses just seem very clear. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, he did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might save. If anyone does not believe in me, I do not condemn them because I came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. It just seems so clear. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world world. It just seems very, very plain to me that the word world there means everyone, every single person that has ever lived and every single person that will ever live. But they, the Calvinists insist that this word world should be translated as God loving both Jews and Gentiles. God is the savior of the world in the sense that he is the savior of both Jews and Gentiles, but he is not the savior of those who do not believe in him. He did not die for the sins of those who do not believe in him. And I think that is absolutely false, especially in light of the passage in John 12 that I said I would look at in more detail here in this video. And so that's what I want to do. I want to go to John chapter 12 beginning at verse 37. Now, the context of this passage is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This is a few days before his crucifixion. It's the week of his crucifixion. And he specifically um, went into Jerusalem uh, riding on a donkey. He did many miracles. And um, it says here in verse 37, though he had done so many signs before them, yet they did not believe in him. This fulfilled the words spoken by Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our report? 
to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So clearly here, John is talking about people that have rejected Jesus, that have refused to believe in him. And despite the fact that Jesus did many miracles, they still refused to believe in him. And this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now let's keep reading. Therefore, they could not believe. Notice that these people could not believe. They were clearly not the elect, right? These people could not believe. Therefore, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes and perceive with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. So clearly this is describing people that have been hardened by God. Their eyes have been blinded by God. They have refused to believe in Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading. Isaiah said this when he saw his glory and spoke of him. This is a clear reference to the deity of Christ. Yet many of the rulers also believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. Jesus cried out, He who believes in me believes not only in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. I think it's very, very clear here in this passage that the word world includes all of those that have rejected Jesus Christ. There's just no way around it. The context of the passage is talking about people that do not believe in Christ, that have refused to believe in Christ, that it's talking about people whose uh, hearts and eyes have been hardened. And Jesus is saying, if anyone doesn't believe in me, I do not judge him because I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. In other words, these unbelievers are included in Christ's definition of the word world. To me, it's very clear here in this passage that Jesus came and died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. Now, let me read to you another passage in 1 Timothy, a couple of passages actually. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially those that believe. Now, Calvinists will come along and and look at this passage and say, "Yes, he is the saviour in some sense of all men because of common grace. You know, because of what Christ did on the cross, uh, God gives us common grace and he gives us the rain and the sunshine, etc. And he withholds us from uh, being as evil as we could be and so forth. However, Jesus himself said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Really, if Jesus is just giving these people uh, this common grace, but not offering them salvation, he's really giving them nothing. God is really giving them nothing according to his own definition, because what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but lose his own soul? But I think that interpretation is, is really just an attempt to get around what this text really says. It says here, for to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially those who believe. Very, very clear. If we go to the book of Titus, chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously, and in godliness in this present world. How can you say that the grace that saves has appeared to all men, if the grace that saves is not given or offered to all men. It's just just silly. I, I just can't see how you can honestly look at the text and reach the conclusion that God only died for the elect. If we go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, it says this, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, to suffer death, crowned with glory and honor, so that he, by the grace of God, should experience, or some translations say, taste death for every man. Very, very, very clear passage of Scripture that Jesus tastes. I mean, how else do you want the Bible to say it? I mean, what else could the Bible have said if it wanted to convey to you the idea that Jesus died for the sins 
of everyone. What other kind of wording could you possibly、uh, be given other than dying for the sins of the world, for every man, tasting death for all,、uh, the savior of all men? I mean, how else could the Bible convey the idea to you that Jesus Christ died for the sins of everyone? Now, let me read to you one more passage, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Chapter 2, verse 1, and it says this But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. To me, this just seems very clear. Jesus purchased every single person on the cross. Even those who rejected him and refused to believe in him, and even the false teachers. To me, the, the evidence from Scripture is simply overwhelming. It's just simply overwhelming. Now, some people they try to say, well, if Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, then shouldn't everybody be saved? And wouldn't that force you to be a universalist? And how can people pay for their own sins in hell for eternity? If Jesus paid for their sins on the cross. And I would say that when people think that way, they're trying to approach the issue with a Western legal mindset rather than approaching the sacrifice of Christ through the prism of the Old Testament sacrifices. In Leviticus chapter 16, you have the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, and it was a sacrifice for the sins of all of the people in Israel, and it really represented Jesus Christ. Now, on the Day of Atonement, what would happen is that the goat would be killed. There was a goat that was killed,、uh, its blood was shed, and then that blood was taken into the very Uh, presence of God, the most holy place, and it was sprinkled over the mercy seat. And then the blood was brought to the tabernacle of the congregation or the holy place. You've got the most holy place and the holy place, also called the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, the blood was only applied when the、uh, blood was、uh, basically sprinkled on the tabernacle of the congregation. Everything was sprinkled in blood. And so, really, when we look at the New Testament, you see the New Testament using this kind of language of us being、uh, cleansed by the blood of Christ in the New Testament. So, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price, He paid the full penalty. Then He ascended into the presence of God and He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. He, he ministers His blood there on our behalf. And when we believe, Peter says that we are sprinkled with His blood. Blood. The blood of Christ is applied to us. Think of the,、uh, the Passover. You know, the, the, the lamb was killed, but they had to abl- apply the blood to the doorposts of their homes before the angel of death would pass by. So it's very clear that the sacrifice of Christ is for the sins of the whole world,、uh, but it needs to be applied, and it is applied when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Christ. That is how we are to see it. And so, this, this whole concept of double jeopardy, which is not taught in the scriptures, it does not even come into the subject when we look at the atonement of Christ through the prism of the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. Now, there's, there's really, I think, zero Bible passages that Calvinists can use to try to come back, but they do try. They really try with John chapter 10. And in John chapter 10, uh, uh, Jesus says um, that um, I lay my life down for the sheep. And he tries to say, well, the Calvinists, sorry, the Calvinists try to say that,、um, that Jesus only laid down his life for the sheep. But it doesn't say he only lays his life down for the sheep. And the other thing is this when you read that passage, by definition, none of us are born sheep. By definition, in the, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, none of us are born sheep. Even if you're one of the elect, you are not born a sheep of God. Why? Because the Bible is very clear in that passage that my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. A stranger they will not follow. So, by definition, none of us are born sheep. We only become sheep of God when we believe. The gospel. All of us at one stage in our life were under the sway of the devil and were influenced by all sorts of false teachers, whether they be worldly secular teachers or false teachers in the church and religious world. All of us listened to the voice of false 
teachers. None of us were born automatically listening to the voice of Christ. It was only when we were born again that we became sheep of God and were able to follow Christ. So the whole argument falls apart on that verse alone. So to me, the Bible is very clear that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world and he didn't just die for the sins of the elect. I hope you've liked this video. If you have, please consider subscribing. Give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment in the comment section. I'll see you in the comment section and you'll see me in my next video.